All right, ladies and gentlemen, my guest this morning is Dr. Ivelaw Lloyd Griffith. He's from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Senior Associate. And he is also a fellow with the Caribbean Policy Consortium and Global Americans. He has published widely on Caribbean issues, including 10 scholarly books. His first novel, Sylvie's Love and Loss, was also recently published. And Dr. Griffiths also has published several dozen articles in reputable scholarly journals and has been the guest on several podcasts. Dr. Ivlov, or shall I say Dr. Griffiths, is the recipient of the 2015 William J. Perry Award for Excellence in Security and Defense Education, named in honor of former U.S. Defense Secretary Dr. William J. Perry, the first person from the Caribbean to receive this honor. Additionally, in 2017, he was awarded the Kakik or Cacique Crown of Honor, Guyana's third highest national honor for excellence in international scholarship and transformational educational leadership. Dr. Griffith has served in several academic leadership roles, including Vice Chancellor, a president of the University of Guyana, president of Fort Valley State University in Georgia, provost of Radford University in Virginia, and of York College, the City University of New York, and as a dean at Florida International University. He's also testified before the U.S. Congress, served as a consultant to several U.S. and international agencies, and has been a visiting scholar at military institutes in Canada, Germany, and the United States. He currently serves on the Vestry Governing Board of St. George's Episcopal Church in Long Island and is an active member of the Rotary Club of Freeport, Merrick. He and Francille, his partner of four decades, have two adult children and one granddaughter. Welcome to the Reading Circle. Microphones, Dr. Ivelaw Lloyd Griffith. Dr. Griffith, good morning again. Good morning, Mark. Delighted to be here. Delighted to be part of this reading circle. And I am glad to have you as well. Now, folks, you all know for the last few weeks I've been sharing with you that my guests, I've actually uh, got them scheduled after going to the Harlem Book Fair. And one of the people I met at the Harlem Book Fair very quickly was Yona, because Yona was running around that day, and Eartha <laughs> was doing her best to try to get us connected, and Yona was running all over the place. So she took one of my cards, and at that point, she started emailing me, and that's how Yona and I got connected, and she connected me with Dr. Griffith. So that's how networking works. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing is that I'm extremely happy about is about a, about a month ago, my guest, Dr. Josue Falaise, he's from Haiti, or from Haiti. And now my guest this morning, Dr. Griffith, is from Guyana. So my show is attracting international guests, folks who were born not just here in the United States, but were born around the world. And that is great because I love people to hear the experiences of other folks. We're all connected. We're all connected, Mark. Yes, we are. And unfortunately, there are those that don't believe that. That's why this election on Tuesday is so important. <laughs> and very critical election. Yes, it is very much so. So what I do with my guests is we kind of walk them through because the interview is about an hour or so. So we kind of walk the listeners through, like, where did everything get started? And, I, you know, as we were talking a couple of minutes ago, you were sharing with me that you grew up in Guyana. So. Growing up there, and I'm very familiar with the Caribbean because at one point my my former wife, she's Jamaican. Okay. So I'm very familiar with the Caribbean and various islands and, and countries, so forth and so on, and, and mindsets and philosophies. I know mm -hmm. um, my day job when I'm not I'm here at the studio is I'm a principal of a school. And Wonderful. I Wonderful. also know how the philosophy or the view of education in other countries in some respects, education is held in a higher regard than it is here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's where I want to kind of like start growing up in Guyana. What was the, you know, for you as a child, where did, what was the value or where was education placed? Because clearly it had to be somewhere in there for you to get to where you are now. Oh, yeah. Well, Mark, let me begin by thanking you for the opportunity to be part of the Reading Circle. 
and to thank Yona for connecting us and beginning to realize, as you have said, that she is a gem. Uh, but getting to your question, you know, many people, when you ask them where Guyana is, they look at you funnily for a while and then you say Caribbean, but then they're not sure. They ask what island. And I remind people that Guyana has a unique advantage of being Caribbean, but not by geography. In terms of geography, we're South American, but historically, culturally, we're Caribbean. And so growing up in Guyana, I had a wonderful opportunity to embrace a broader sense of the world. And part of that embrace from the broader sense of the world was the installation of the value of education. Like many young Guyanese, I was born in the 50s. Uh, it was a time of colonialism transitioning into independence. Guyana became independent in 1966. And the leaders at the time, to their credit, emphasized the importance of broadening your educational horizon, broadening the career potential horizon. And so uh, my path to where I am right now started as a University of Guyana student, studied political science. And interestingly, Mark, I did some of what you were doing. I was a journalist for a while, both in print and in radio. I'll tell you a story about the connection between my journalism time and my later in lifetime as, a, as an academic. It was actually as a journalist covering the Commonwealth Summit in Australia, Melbourne, Australia, where my interest in scholarly endeavors was piqued. And I was covering that summit in Melbourne, Australia, at a very interesting time. It was a time during the conference we heard of the assassination of the president of Egypt, Anwar al-Sadat. But at that conference also was a fascinating conversation about security of small states. You know, the Commonwealth is a large international organization, countries, most of which are formerly British colonies. But you also have within that commonwealth some small countries. Grenada is one of those. Guyana, most of the Caribbean, Anglophone Caribbean are commonwealth members. But you have some countries also in other parts of the world. Small countries, Vanuatu, Malta, Seychelles, Fiji. And there was a fascinating conversation about the challenges, the trauma of small states in the Caribbean, small states in the Commonwealth, including the conversation about Grenada. Grenada, as you recall, had a traumatic experience uh, in the 1980s. That's right. So, so I, I decided, you know, this is a fascinating era. And when I go to graduate school, ultimately, I want to study matters of international security. So that was a connection between my journalism covering that conference in Melbourne, Australia. I think it was 1980. Uh, so when I came to the United States to continue my educational trajectory, I decided that I'm going to make international security a specialization. So I launched into that path, did a PhD, uh, moved around for quite a while, was an academic in Florida and then Georgia and then Virginia and then New York and after a while, my wife says, you're not moving around anymore. We, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she Understood. Said to, me one time, you know, yeah, said to me at one time, I know we do, you do national security studies, but I am not in the army, honey. I am not, <laughs> I am not moving anyway. I'm not moving anymore. Yeah, so that's the origin story from Guyana. Well, you see, what's interesting is, one, we never know what's going to be the spark. Like you just said, attending that conference or covering that particular conference sparked something in you in terms of the interest now in the security. So we never Absolutely. know what's going to be. And that's why, you know, working in education with kids, you know, I share with my staff all the time. We never know because I get, I get a lot of guest speakers come in and present to my boys. I have a elementary school and a middle school. I, my school runs from grades three to eight. And I have right. many guests come in to present to them and speak to them. And cause I never know which guest is a child going to say, I want to be like him or I want to be like mm -hmm. her. I want to do that. I want to do this because of yeah. what they shared. 
Now, as a student, as a child, I mean, were you like studious, like in grade school or grammar school, or or did you begin to love education more as you went through the process, coming up through how college and you know high school, college, so forth and so on? Students from the time in early days, I mean, there was a, you know, we we had we had the fortune or misfortune of being from poor families, and that poor family environment inspired you to want to be more than what you saw around you. Right. And so that was the inspiration to use education as a path to be more than the circumstances in which you found yourself. And there were some of us, one of whom is still a good buddy, uh, that we in the Bahamas. We latched on to the idea of we've got to be the first and second in our classes at all times. That's right. Is that Dr. Godfrey Springer. So that- Godfrey and I uh, were a motivation for each other, an inspiration for each other. He took the path of veterinary medicine. I took the path of political science. But it was from a place of saying, you know, I cannot, I don't have the luxury of being now. I've got to be better in the future than what my now, what my present present is. That is absolutely correct. And again, that's the message that I am constantly sharing with my students, that whatever you endeavor, be always shoot to be the best at it. Now, if you don't get there, you're still going to get higher than you would have gotten had you not been shooting to be the best. Right. Um, so yeah. that is always like, regardless of what you're in, I mean, because that's, that's what drives me as well. It's like, well, whatever I'm going to take on, I'm going to be the best at it. And so yeah. far in every one of my organizations that I've been in, ultimately have wound up being recognized as whatever of the year, best of this, best of that. Because that's, you know, that's what we set out to do. And like, and like you said, you just said in terms of like having an accountability partner, you and your buddy wound up being accountability partners for each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Mark, I, I embrace excellence quite early in my professional and personal life. And if you go to the places where I had an opportunity to serve as an educational leader at FIU, at your college in, in Queens, uh, in Georgia, Radford in Virginia, you'll find something hopefully still on one of the walls. And it's a quotation from Aristotle about excellence. And it says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act. A habit. That is correct. Many decades I carry that is in my email as a signature, reminding myself that it's not good enough to be good. You've got to pursue better. You've got correct. To be and uh, Aristotle was a reminder, an inspiration that we are what we repeatedly do. You know, and I would say to my students when I talk regularly, excellence doesn't mean getting an A. Correct. In one class in this semester and then think you're you're in the top of the world, you've got to habituate it. That was a part that was a point of Aristotle's proposition. You've got to habituate best practices, good practices, improving where you are, looking to strive to move further ahead. So excellence is something that I embrace quite early. So now I, I see here you have vice chancellor, but you have president and in- Parentheses. So, were you were president at the University of Guyana? The the equivalent of president in the United States gotcha. is vice chancellor. Okay, and and that has to do with the way in which Guyana and Jamaica and other countries in the Commonwealth, part of the former British Empire, that's how they style their executive head of the university. It's called a vice chancellor. Correct. Mm-hmm. I mean, now, the message is good because, again, this, the population that I serve is black and brown kids. My my mm-hmm. entire school is made up of Hispanic and African-American males. Matter of fact, I have a, a, it's a leadership school. It's an all-male school, single-gender school. And the message that you just said is exactly what we're trying to get across in terms of excellence. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. Because, see, this is the thing. And I don't know, like, when I get into the Caribbean companies, a lot of times racism is different than racism and prejudice here because everybody looks the same. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. here, I mean, and, 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 it's, and it's rearing its head again, unfortunately, over the last few years. I don't think it's ever went away, but it, it's just been more pronounced now. Wherein if your right. skin is dark, the expectation is that you're not striving for excellence. Yep, yep. 
And Martha, you shouldn't be striving for excellence. Exactly. How dare you want to be better than what you are? That's exactly right. And see, so that's why when I, you know, first off, I've had, this is my 23rd year on the air, and I've had so many wonderful guests. But we've had, I've had the opportunity for those who've listened over the long term to really debunk some myths in terms of, mm-hmm. no, there are excellent and plenty of us who mm-hmm. are dark skin or who from various countries, uh, so forth and so on, who are excellent. All of these things are stereotypes and myths. As a matter of fact, that, that comedian, I don't even know his name, that made that crack about, Puerto Rico being trash or, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, this is how people think and see. Yeah. And so I, like you, I am always looking to debunk that myth. <laughs> Important to continue. And, you know, to debunk it, not only among people who look like us, black and brown people, but debunk it among people who don't look like Correct. us. Correct. Part of what they hold as a view is a function of their education. So we need as much as to re-educate them as we continue to educate our own. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah, right. You, 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 bingo. A lot have not been, because exposure is the key. A lot of people mm-hmm. um, have not been. It's, it's interesting, because here in this country, like you could wind up going to uh, a college or a university that's predominantly Caucasian, and if you appear there in, you know, you're African-American or black or Caribbean or what have you, that they're actually, there are some folks still to this day looking for us to have a tail. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like, um, but again, back to the edge, if, if the only place you've ever been is in the mountains or in the hicks or, you know, in the sticks somewhere and you've never been educated or been around people who look different, if all you've been told is this nonsense, then, yeah, that's what you're going to be looking for. That's what you're going to be expecting. Yep. Yep. You know, I, I have an idiosyncrasy that my son has adopted. People would ask, oh, you've got an interesting name. Where are you from? I would say I give you five guesses to figure it out. <laughs> and sometimes they, the people with whom I speak don't have a clue of the geography of the world. Uh, and most people don't. <laughs> they were, they you say, you sound like you're from the island. I say, well, I'm from the Caribbean, but not an island. And you can see the mind and the brain trying to figure out, how is he from the Caribbean and not an island? <laughs> and then I say, well, think of, think of mainland. And they can't figure it out. I remember I, I was the dean of the FIU at the time, taking a group of students to Utah. Because uh, I was dean of the Honors College. We had an honors conference. Right. And we got into this hotel, and I'm checking in. Oh, Dean Griffith, you've got a wonderful name. Where are you from? I said, I'm leaving on Friday. Then I check out, tell me where I'm from. I was there for three days at that <laughs> conference. I'm checking out. And this, the woman out of the, checking me out still couldn't figure out. I'm saying to myself, can you at least Google it? <laughs> you didn't have, have the foresight to think. And I left that hotel not even telling her. I said, you got to figure it out. So That's right. very often, it, 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 it's, a, it's a deficit in the knowledge. No, it really is. And see, this is the thing. Now, all right. This, again, some of the deficit is because they don't want to know. Now, some mm-hmm. of it is, all right, you're not exposed to it or you haven't been taught it or whatever. But some of it is, no, I don't want to. Now, I expect you to know everything about me, but I don't care anything about you. Some mm-hmm. of it is that. Mm-hmm. Yep. But, you know, some of it is the education to which they were exposed in middle school, in grade school, Correct. in college. And it's not only among people who don't look like us. Correct. It's also about people who look like us. Well, this is the... No, you're absolutely right, because this is the battle that I'm... As a matter of fact, I'm working on a dissertation now myself. And what I'm looking at, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm researching is... There's this whole thing, in, as you know, in the country with the standardized testing. And there's always right. this major focus on black-white gap. But if you really look at it, in certain respects, there's a black, black gap. There are students who do well on those standardized tests, and there are those who (laughs) do awful. So what is the difference between the black child who does do well in comparison to the black child who doesn't do well? And interestingly enough, Dr. Griffith, I'm doing some of my research, what came into play was you had some of us that are saying, we don't want to do education because that makes us look white. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. we don't value education because if you're smart or if you are excellent, then you're acting white. And that, that was coming up in the research. 
and part of that was a function of how we were made to believe are the horizons and the trajectories that we can aim for. Correct. You know, if we are aiming too high into that white sphere, we aim black. But you're black, and you can aim high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is true. Mm-hmm. I mean, but but I mean, this was I was like, okay, now that was that was an angle I had not looked at. I mean, I've always heard because I speak well as a kid, you talk white. I had gotten, a, but I had not heard of, like this whole notion of being educated is white. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh wait a minute now, because yep. you, you know, but so yeah, that 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 came up as a, as a part of the research that some parents. I mean, I mean for the most part, and I see it too, because I have to constantly have this discussion as well. Don't dumb yourself down. Absolutely. Don't dumb yourself down to fit in because you're afraid your peers are going to tease you because you were smart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, one of the constant refrains I had when I was at different universities and teaching, I would say to students, why are you sitting in the back of the class? You come right. into a classroom, you see the seats in front that are free, are open, sit in front. Correct. Because it's, it's a reflection of what you think you are in regard to what your education horizon should be. You don't think you're good enough to sit in the front? That but is correct. It's designed for us to sit in the front of the bus and the front of the, the train. That is correct. But unwittingly, it's a reflection of where some of us think we are or where we could be. We don't think we're good enough to sit in the front. That is correct. Now, this is, this is let me see, this is my fourth degree that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And every time I'm in any program, I make sure I'm front and center. I usually sit right there in front of the professor. <laughs> it's to be. That's your place. It really and is. Some people may expect you to go to the back. That is correct. Some people who don't look like you or some people who look like you because, my gosh, what is he trying to prove? Is he trying to be better than us? Well, I'm good enough to be in the front if I want to be in the front. That is correct. I, I've had to, like, I have been adjunct professors at a few different uh, universities, colleges here in New Jersey. And whenever I was at one, and I was young at that point, this is going back like 25, 30 years ago, and I was young mm-hmm. at that time. And I would get to the class first, and I, I wouldn't go behind the teacher's desk because the, the university it was a private university, predominantly Caucasian. And I wouldn't go mm-hmm. behind the teacher's desk. I'd just kind of mill around the class, and the students would come in and they'd hang out and play and do whatever they were going to do because they were college kids. And then when right. the time came for the class, I would now go walk behind the desk. You would have to see the shock on their face <laughs> when their <laughs> professor was black. Oh yes, oh yes. And they like you? Yes, I'm the I'm your professor, and uh, mm-hmm. they just did not because I didn't even have any black students in the class. Maybe one, if that. Yeah. But then they just could not like our prof- yeah your professor is black um, so you're mm-hmm. about in terms of the expectation and see I'm really glad to be talking to you because again it's about my there's my passions uh, I have a few passions but two of them are reading and education hence vital passion. the show hence the reading circle it started 23 years ago um, the, the station manager was looking for somebody to do a show on books and I happened to be here in, at the studio for another purpose. He said, I thought you'd be perfect for it. And that's the, the Cliff Notes version of how uh, I got started here back in 2001. For those of you in the listening audience, if you've just joined me, I hope you've been with me since six, but definitely hope you've been with me since seven. My guest this morning is Dr. Ivlaw Lloyd Griffith. And Dr. Griffith and I are talking about education. We are talking about reading. As a matter of fact, that will be my next quote as we lead into your writing. Were you a reader as a child? Because most people who are writers were readers or are readers, shall I say. Were you a reader as a child? Oh, yes. Absolutely. See, there's a connection. It's right there. the, the, the The saying reading is fundamental was one embraced by some of us before we knew of the saying. And again, it was a function of you are in an environment, you're in circumstance where you were told that partly because the folk around you didn't go too far educationally, right. you had an obligation to go. And it quickly became part of the mantra that to get there, you've got to go there. And if one of the places to go is to read. Absolutely. Whether the reading is in, your home, the reading is in the library, I spent many days after school, many hours after school in the public library in Georgetown, getting books that were not part of my 
home circle books that are not part of the school circle. So reading is fundamental. No, it really is because, see, reading is a passion of mine. And I tell my students and my teachers for that matter, I said, listen, I don't encourage and emphasize and put such an emphasis on reading just because I'm an avid reader or I love reading. I'm helping you to understand it is the foundation and the basis for every other subject. If mm-hmm. you do not read and comprehend well, you're not, even with our, because the math teacher will say, well, math is numbers. Yeah, but the bulk of our math problems now are word problems. Mm-hmm. You still have to be able to read the word problem, comprehend it, figure out what is it the person who put the problem together has thrown extra information in there. What is it I need, what I don't need to solve mm-hmm. this problem? Like you said, yep. figure it out. And so if you don't read well and you don't comprehend well, you're not going to do well in any other subject. And I'm not downplaying or, as the kids can say, throwing shade on the other subjects. It's just that mm-hmm. reading is kind of like the foundation for it. So yep. now go into school in Guyana, because a lot of times whenever I'm dealing with folks from other countries here in the United States, education is like free. I mean, that's the other thing I tell my students. All you got to do is come. When you go to these other countries, usually there's a whole lot involved in just being able to go to school. Was it that way in Guyana? Yes and no. Uh, Education was a kind of a mixed tier. You had a free public system, but partly because the public system, and I'm talking about what we'll call primary and secondary, grade school, high school, partly because it was underfunded, quality didn't tend often to be high. So the private sector, the private schools, where, where where the action is if you really want to get ahead. And so I went to private school. University was free. I had oh. the opportunity to go to University of Ghana. It was entirely free. Uh, so you had, but you also had private universities. It was a mixed bag. Right. The free university and at the university level. Yeah. yeah. I asked that because I've had experiences from, I mean, I remember one when I was teaching because I taught language arts in eighth grade. And I remember a student, matter of fact, I know her name. It's like, and this is going back, back into like 2000, 2002, 2003. I still remember her name, Hannah Obadiah. She came over from mm-hmm. Africa. And she got here mid-school year, around December or January, and outpointed all the existing students. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she said she wanted to be yep. a doctor. She was in eighth grade, and she already said, I want to be a doctor. And I said, I, you're going to mm-hmm. get there. But the emphasis and the focus and the drive to be educated, what I have experienced mm-hmm. for my children who come over from other countries, generally is higher than the kids who are here in America. And like I said, my former yep. wife uh, was from Jamaica, and she would always say how it's too free here, that whenever she was going to school, mm-hmm. they had to pay for uniforms, they had to pay for books, they had to pay for transportation, mm-hmm. they had to pay for their lunch. There was no government assistance like there is here in the United States, where, like, in all honesty, my kids get lunch, they get breakfast, they get a snack at the end of the day, mm-hmm. um, we'll provide uniforms for them, they get medical care, they get free tutoring, they get, and still don't want to do anything. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. You know, I, very often I would, and I can only vent what I'm about to tell you to students who will look like us, black and brown. Right. I would say to those black and brown students, do you realize how many people died and struggled for you to have the opportunity that you're getting now and you're not using it maximally? Uh, Do you realize how you're making your career path handicapped by not pursuing maximally the opportunities? Correct. Do you realize how psychologically you're setting yourself back by always trying to go to the back of the class? Correct trying to get the easy way out. And you've got to challenge them to go beyond what they think are the perimeters of their possibilities. And largely because in very many cases, it comes too free, too easy. Correct. Yep. That is absolutely right. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm. wow. I mean, it is, it is something to see because you're like, it's like you, and that's not all of my students. I'm not generalizing. But a, mm-hmm. a good portion of them is like, there's no reason to be honest with you for all of them not to be excellent because you have the opportunity. Right, right. So let's talk in terms of, because now, like, I, I'm getting really familiar now that I'm pursuing this this particular degree. I'm getting really familiar in scholarly work and scholarly writing and journals and articles and so forth and so on. Talk a little bit about, like, whenever you're, like, how do you come up with what you want to write about and what you want to research, what you want to study? 
Well, you know, the, the, the spark, as you said quite widely, for me to pursue this line of scholarly endeavor in the national security, that spark was Melbourne, Australia, in 1980. So when I went to graduate school, I had to carve out a perimeter in international security for me to engage in, and I carved out the Caribbean as a geographic perimeter. And so it was, what are the issues in the Caribbean that would fall within the ambit of a security dilemma? And quite early in my career, I decided to do two things insofar as looking at the security arena for the Caribbean. One, to take it in a broader context than traditionally would have been viewed. And I'll tell you what that means in a minute. And two, identify what were some of the critical and still are some of the critical security issues. Insofar as the broader than generally taken security, security for many international scholars had to do essentially with guns and butter. You know, had to do with military, had to do with fighting one country fighting another, had to do with one state against another state. But as I viewed the Caribbean and other countries in the small parts of the world, then called the third world, it was not realistic to define security in that, in those terms only. And so over the years, I have defined the perimeter of what security is defined to be as both an internal reality and an external reality. And so for me, Caribbean security has to do with what are the challenges of people outside your country against you? Uh, but also, what are some of the challenges against you internally? Correct. Okay, take, for example, you take Haiti in its contemporary times. You can't think of Haiti security only as who from the outside is trying to attack Haiti. It's as much what's happening on the inside. Correct. That is jeopardizing the people's safety, the people's security, the people's ability to conduct themselves um, normal, stable terms. And in the context of the second issue, I identified quite early a number of things that were critical to understanding what are the challenges to the Caribbean security. Drug trafficking was one of those. And it still is. As a matter of fact, early this year, I had another book published called Challenge Sovereignty, where I looked at drug trafficking, drugs phenomenon writ large, trafficking, money laundering, and so on are part of the drugs reality. But the crime issue is a significant issue to the Caribbean, and the crime issue has both internal and external dimensions to it. So I have, over the decades, the last three and a half decades, embraced looking at security, and that's broader than national security terms, but also looking at the critical security challenges and talking about them, studying, giving expert testimony about them, speaking about him at conferences and serving as a consultant in a variety of respects. So it's looking at what the reality of the region has been and then helping to educate myself and educate others as to how to manage and navigate that reality. Drugs is a major part of that reality. Crime is a major part of that reality. Cyber crime is an important new phenomenon, relatively new phenomenon in the Caribbean that is driving Caribbean country is crazy. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's my daughter's fear. She's in cybersecurity. She's down in uh, D.C. And she she Good. does that. She's doing cybersecurity. I ask you the question about the scholarly work because I want to contrast it with now you've released your first novel. Mm-hmm. And scholar work and reading scholar articles and writing scholar articles are a totally different genre. So how did mm-hmm. you, one... How did you come to the decision that you wanted to do a novel and then work us to where the idea came from? And how did you switch off between academic writing and novel writing? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, th- there is a link between the scholarly pursuit and the novel. And I'll tell you the backstory to that link. I had a, I had a big grant from the MacArthur Foundation back in the 90s, early 90s to do an empirical study using the Caribbean to 
to apply a concept I had originated that I had published early in a Canadian journal. And that grant allowed me to travel for the field research component to several different countries. One of the countries was Grenada. And Mark, as you probably know from your wife and other friends who are immigrants, when you've got someone who's going back to a region or a country where he has people or he's from, friends where he's living might say, take this package to my friend back in X place. I'm sure your wife got a lot of Take this back for a family in, in Jamaica when you're right. going back to Jamaica. Right. And so I was going to Grenada for this part of the field work, and a friend, actually, he was living in New Jersey at the time, gave me a package for a friend of his in Grenada. So I got to Grenada, Mark, and found this friend. We met at the, at the pub, started to that started to have beers, started to have hors d'oeuvres. And over the beers and hors d'oeuvres, after a few hours, this friend became very comfortable with me. She did not know what I was doing in Grenada. She didn't know that I was studying drugs, drugs issues. And she started to relate her life story. Part of her life story, Mark, was that she had been deported from Canada because of drugs. Ah, uh, okay. Now, she was back in Renata, also engaged in drug work. And she felt so comfortable with me after a while, Mark, he offered to sell me some cocaine. Wow. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, honey, I don't do that kind of stuff. I don't do any drugs. She said, Doc... You can use it for sex. I am flabbergasted, right. bewildered, befuddled. So what the hell is this woman talking about? Right. This, this is a woman in her early 30s. And there is, there it is. She's telling me I can use the cocaine for sexual pleasure. Now, what do you think an average guy would want to know? Right. How? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, honey, I don't use drugs, but how does this thing work? And would you believe I got an education about how to use cocaine to enhance my sexual experience? This thing was such a bizarre experience. I would never have thought that in this wonderful little place, what is called the Spice Isle, I would meet a young woman who would educate me right. about how to use in drugs. So... I have a part of this scholarly book. The book is called Drugs and Security in the Caribbean. It came out in 1997, University of Penn State University Press. I remember one of the reviews of the manuscript said in his commentary, Professor Griffith needs to put a footnote saying he's not advocating the use of cocaine for sex. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> which, which I did. At the end of this experience, I said, you know, I've got to write a story about this, this, this experience. This is so unique, so bizarre, so unexpected. And it was at that moment, at that experience in Grenada, I think it was 1994, I decided that one of these days when I retire, I'm going to write a novel building on this experience. So the novel came out, the germ of the novel came out of that that lived experience, that young woman in Grenada, who schooled me on how to use cocaine for sexual experience, sexual pleasure. Now, you, you asked a very important question. The transition from scholarly writing to writing a novel was not an easy one necessarily. But it was helped by my journalistic experiences and, and skills. You know, as a journalist, as you know, as a journalist, you've got to write whether a radio piece or a print piece. You've got a number of words or a number of minutes to work with. You've got a deadline to operate within. You've got some That's parameters. correct. So I use my skill set from the journalism days to be able to fashion. And I had some wonderful editors and feedback from friends. But here's the major thing I had to contend with. 
as a scholar, you want to provide evidence. You want to put footnotes. correct you want to put references. You want to. <laughs> My friends and editors, the I've law, stick to the storyline. Forget all these inclinations to do the footnotes. You, you don't need footnotes in an it It was. I had to give up some of my scholarly self and embrace a fiction self. Correct. Becoming a fiction guy. But it was a remarkable learning experience and rewriting. But, you know, it, it also helped that partly because of my journalism days, I had always over the decades been inclined to write with simple explanatory language in mind. Not too much jargon, not too many big words right. to pretend that I'm all this intellectual. That's helped. And see, it's interesting because, like, for me, I'm, the transition is just the opposite way. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. used to writing blogs. I'm used to writing articles and so forth and so on that are not scholar articles. So now to mm -hmm. get into the academic writing, I've had to do yep. just the reverse of you in terms of the footnoting and the citing yep. and the so forth and yep. so on. Yep. So I know yep. exactly what you mean to go the opposite direction of what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. so, so is Sylvie the person that you met is that is Sylvie that character? The the character is built around that woman. Her name is not Sylvie. Right. Sylvie is the name that I adopted from another experience. But it was a story built around Sylvie's lived reality. Okay. And part of her lived reality, as I tell in the novel, is where one in which she grew up in a family that was also in a poverty zone, a poor zone. Right. She had the misfortune of being one of five kids whose mother and father abandoned them. The, the mother, her mother, stay-at-home mom, father was a school teacher, the father was a player, and so the father being a player had an affair with a couple of his students. Oh, okay. Students were teenagers, one of right. them got pregnant. Okay. In order for him to avoid being arrested for rape, that is very rape, he fled the island. Okay. So he fled the island, left his wife, left his wife who was there with an adopted mother. So the wife now with five kids, no husband, who left in this made-up story to go back to the place where he was from, she was now embraced by um, adopted grandmother, adopted mother, and then she became depressed and she got caught up in her own sense of there is no end to having a life under these circumstances. So she took off with a guy from Trinidad. Okay. And so Sylvie was one of five who grew up in these circumstances that this Sylvie's adopted grandmother was a market vendor, poverty zone, but instilled in her the importance of education. Okay. Of doing best in school. And so she excelled in school, got a job as a receptionist at one of the, the best hotels in the island, top of the line, five-star hotel. And while she was in this hotel, she fell in love with one of the guests. Okay. So this is because the title of the book, Listening Artists, and, and the author, Dr. Griffith, is describing it for you. We don't give it all away because we want people to purchase the book. I actually downloaded it last night. So that you piqued, you piqued my curiosity because I have it. And I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... Because I love the cover on it, um, the, you know, with her standing there overlooking the water and, and, you know, between the trees. And, you know, each of my guests, I always discuss cover. How did they come to the cover? Because I, you know, I truly am kind of one of those... Uh, you can't judge a book by its cover, but at the same mm -hmm. time, I think a book is, you know, a cover is extremely important because mm -hmm. that's the first thing people see, you know, right. prior to well, I, digital, you know, you walked into the bookstore and you had to kind of like peruse. So talk to me a little bit about the choice of cover. Well, I've got to thank my production and editorial team at the publisher, Wordy Press. I had nothing to do with the cover except to suggest what are some of the main elements of what I would like to see in a cover. Okay. And I, and I said to them, here are some features I'd love to see represented, and it would be good if you gave me three samples, three options. And this is the what's, what's 
now the the cover is the option that I went with for two reasons. One, it captured some of the scenery of the Caribbean. Central to that scenery is the role and presence of a woman, a woman who you can see but also not see. Right, because her back is turned to you. That's right. Her back is turned to you. I wanted the kind of a mystery to be there and part of what should capture people coming to buy this book and looking at it is a kind of a known but unknown. Correct. And so Sylvie is there, but Sylvie is not really visible fully, frontally. Part of the landscape is, is was important. So I want to thank the people at Wordy for the production of the, of the cover. Powerful cover. Wonderful cover. Yeah. So as you were generating your, I mean, you clearly, like I said, like we were just talking about academic writing and novel writing, because now with novel writing, you're using your imagination. You're creating a storyline. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. what was that process like? Well, I mean, did, okay, did Sylvie come alive for you? Was, I mean, because I've had authors who say, like, their characters actually was like, almost like lived with them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Sylvie did come alive. <laughs> and it, it, part, part of, the, the, part of the, my experience with living with Sylvie was trying to keep her alive throughout the story. Right. Uh, if, if, there, if there is one thing a reviewer will not be able to say is that Sylvie disappears in one of the chapters. Sylvie is a constant denominator, a presence throughout the story. And I think, again, I have to rely upon my journalistic experiences in crafting the outline, identifying the characters. Uh, I've got to thank my wife from saving me from myself. You know, this book would have been much larger than 232 pages. I did not been for my wife. She <laughs> said to me after a while, she said, honey, this is your first novel. Nobody wants to read 500 pages. Right. <laughs> Keep it short. <laughs> so I initially had 11 chapters. I had 11 chapters in mind. And I took my wife's advice. And I said, let me just cut this thing. Keep it short. And so, Mark, I've got at least a couple, 10, 12% of what would be the next book. Okay, there you go. Because now yeah. you, could, you could do a sequel or a continuation. Now, there is, is going to be a continuation. Ah. And then, when you get to the end of the book, I'm not going to let you... No, don't, 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 don't tell us. No, I'm no. I'm telling your readers. But a perceptive reader would be able to sense that there's a sequel coming. Yeah, it's one of those, it's got to be something more. You leave folks hanging. But you know what? But good yeah. authors, that's what they do. They leave the reader hanging. They they leave mm-hmm. them wanting more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, I want to emphasize a couple of things, Mark. One, I wanted to write a novel with Sylvie's life experience that was not all about sadness. Right. But it also was one about reconciliation. There was one about gratitude. It was one about gratitude. It was one about rising. You know, after you fall, you rise. Correct. So throughout the, the novel, I wanted to plant the notion of not only reconciliation and gratitude, but blessings. Even under dire circumstances, there were blessings showered on Sylvie and the family. Correct. Uh, And so gratitude is one of the themes, what I call one of the watermarks of the novel. I I, I invoke a lot of literature and music in the book. And one one of the people who I invoke, and I would recommend to your listeners, if you don't know of her, listen to some of her music, a dynamic young Jamaican artist called Kofi. She goes by the name Kofi. She has a wonderful what I call anthem to gratitude called Toast. And the point of that song, Toast, is to celebrate blessings, to also remember that in life, no matter how bad things are, you're blessed. So gratitude must also be constantly reminding yourself that you've got to be thankful for gratitude and blessings. So I, I view this book as also a book where although there are lots of lows, there are highs, 
And part of the high is a reflection of the gratitude, the blessings. And the complexity of the book is also part of the novel. It's a geographic complexity. There is a character complexity. There is a values complexity. And I wanted to also reflect in this book some of the harsh realities of the modern Caribbean. It's not a land of sun and sea. Right. And That's exactly there's right. A lot of, there's a lot of raw, wrong stuff happening. That is correct. The crime is, the crime is there. The infidelity is there. The, the dishonesty is there. But the reconciliation, the blessings are also there. Now, the, the artist is Coffee, K-O-F-F-E-E, and the song was yep. Toast. Okay, I'm going to play it. I'll, whenever the interview's over, whenever I go back to the music segment, I'm going to yep. play it. I'm going to put it on. Toast. Toast. Blessings. Blessings are there. So hopefully people will have been piqued in their interest enough to buy and read Sylvie's Love and Loss and uh, my first novel. I begin to work on the second one next year. Once I finish, I'm working on a scholarly book on Guyana right now. Once that is out, I'll begin in earnest working on the second novel. Well, you've brought you've 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 segued right into where we are at the interview point, and that's where I'll give you the opportunity to promote uh, websites, mm-hmm. anything about the book. Uh, Anything about, you know, your appearances or your work, how folks can get in touch with you. The only thing you can't say is a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing you cannot say is a price or a dollar. But anything short of that, you can shout people out. You can, you know, appearances, books, upcoming, whatever you want to do. I'm shutting Mm -hmm. the microphone off and you get a chance to promote. Okay. Tell me when you're ready, Mark. We're ready now. It's on you. All righty. Well, I want to thank you and thank all the listeners and potential buyers of the book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Wordy Press. You can find this book and my other books on my website, jefftheleo.com, J-E-F-F-T-H-E-L-E-O.com. And there is a wonderful event being hosted to launch it on November 18 at Adelphi University here in Long Island. If you have a chance, come. I think it's at uh, 12.30. Sylvie's Love and Loss, in my view, is a wonderful, easy read. I got a note from a, a friend in London who said he just returned from Guyana, and he was so consumed he couldn't put the book down after he started reading it. And he's an award-winning author. Wow. So he sent me this, this email commending me. He said in four hours he was done with Sylvie's Love and Loss. <laughs> well, like I said, I'm looking forward to reading it. I downloaded it last night. I'm looking forward yep. to reading it. Yep. And now that we've talked about it, I'm really looking forward to reading it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Go get it, Mark. Go get it. Go get it. <laughs> well... I thank you so much. I have to thank Yona. I'll email her as well. But I thank you so much for rising early on a Saturday morning to talk about your work and to join me. Uh, I do record the shows and I archive them on my YouTube channel. So for the folks who did not rise early with us, they still have an opportunity to go back and they can hear the interview on YouTube. Um, I'm, at the moment, I'm backed up. I have like two or three weeks worth that I need to get up and going. And now this will be the fourth, I think, or either the third, one or the other. But by the end of this week, because I have a day off on, well, Tuesday I have off for election day. And then Friday okay. we have another day off. So this week I intend to get caught up on all the shows. Good. Good. <laughs> well, once, once, the, once the recorded version is available, I'll post it on my LinkedIn and Facebook yes. and, my, and my website as well. Yes, I'm glad you said it because once I send you the links, because I'm going to email to you, it would be an MP3 link and the link from the YouTube. You do what you want with it. They're yours. I don't, I don't get caught right. up and crazed into copyrights and trademarks and all that kind of stuff. Once <laughs> I send them out, they're yours. Share them however you'd like. Thank you much, Mark. All right. Well, thank you for joining me this morning. Had a blast talking to you. Uh, again, you know, debunking and demystifying these stereotypes and myths. Um, you know, I, I love it. And, you know, again, education and reading, they're two of my passions. So they kind of conjoined here this morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Mark. Same here. And I'll be in touch. Thank you much. All right. Take Have care. Thank you. You too. 
Bye now. All right, that brings us to the end of 